Welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Muntz, and today on this episode, I will be welcoming guest Elisa Jansen Jones, otherwise known as the Music Ed Mentor, to the show. She's the host of the Music Ed Mentor podcast, and I'm really excited to have a conversation with her today about avoiding burnout and other life hacks uh, from an expert music educator. This show also will go down in history on the Coralosophy podcast as being the first use of some colorful language about 30 minutes in, so this is your trigger warning. Uh, this conversation is a lot of fun, and it's already been recorded, obviously, um, and we've got some great laughs and some great insights up ahead for you, so I'm going to keep this intro really short, uh, and we'll get right to the interview. Before we do, got to make sure I shout out our two sh- uh, sponsors for the show. RyanMain.com is an excellent resource for choral directors and music teachers at ryanmain.com you will find a plethora of fine arrangements and compositions that you can use with your choirs and he sells them in a very innovative way for one fee one site license fee you can get a pdf that's licensed to you and you are allowed to make as many copies as you want into perpetuity so if you've got a uh, a decent number of singers that can be a very economical thing Uh, for example i I'm doing one of his pieces with 110 singers right now, and one fee for all those copies. It's a a steal for us, Um, and so we encourage you to check out the way that he sells his music there, and also the the music itself is uh, more than worthwhile. He's got some great stuff, so check that out. Also, what I firmly believe is the, uh, the single best sight reading and literacy tool on the market right now is sightreadingfactory.com. They just recently updated their page. They've got a bunch of new features, a very slick interface. So head over to sightreadingfactory.com and work that into your classroom routine every single day, and you will see a change in how your students read the music, but not only that, but understand the music and are able to explain the music as they become more and more comfortable with it. So head on over to sightreadingfactory.com and enter Coralosophy at checkout when you get your membership, renew your membership, or even better, getting memberships for you and your students so they can do homework and assignments monitored by you on this awesome product. Without any further ado, I'm going to take us directly now to the interview with Elisa Jansen Jones. And I think that as you'll hear that as we get to know each other over the course of the first few minutes of the interview, uh, we start having lots and lots of fun. Uh, This is the first time I have guffawed on an episode. Uh, Also, as I mentioned earlier, um, we tell some quite interesting stories. So I hope you stick with it all the way to the end and learn something along the way as you're being entertained by our silliness. Enjoy. Okay, I'm here with Elisa Jansen Jones. Uh, she's a music teacher uh, who's passionate about teaching music teachers how to teach music. Uh, she does a lot of stuff, and we're going to hear more from her and the details of all the different things she does to help deliver uh, quality music education to music educators and to students. But she is the host of the Music Ed Mentor podcast. Uh, she's also a K through eight music teacher, band and choir. Uh, she hosts the International Music Education Summit and has the Music Ed Mentor blog, among other things. Uh, she's a dynamo, it seems, and, uh, and really seems to be uh, dive, diving into all kinds of areas of innovative uh, music education. So I'm excited to talk to Elisa. Elisa, welcome. Um, thanks, Chris. It's good to be here. So we decided to um, kind of center our chat around the idea of uh, avoiding burnout from the teacher, uh, also some any life hacks that, uh, that you have found in that area. I know you've worked with and given advice to a lot of music educators through all of your platforms. So I'm going to start with a challenging question for you in our conversation. Uh, has there ever been a moment, or tell us a story if you could, can, of a time where you've ever had to follow your own advice? related to uh, <clears throat> to burnout or was that was there ever that day where you needed the music ed mentor that you are y- yes the answer is yes and it's every single day okay tell us e- about that every single day oh but you want to you want a story okay yeah, so yeah. um 
so I'm in my fourth year at my job and the first three years I was part-time. So it was not excessively challenging to have, you know, my four hour a day job, um, teaching little kids. And I just, I, I saw it as I would go and I'd play with them and I'd put on three or four programs a year and it was awesome. And then I had plenty of time to podcast. And then I had time to be with my kids and my husband. And, um, I had time to, I, I applied and became the director of our community band. And I still was able to ride my bike and, and commute by bike and go hiking and trail running and all these other things that I love. And then this year I started full time and it has been amazing, first of all, because I was able to just um, the, the band teacher who, who taught middle school just retired. Um, and so I was able to pretty seamlessly step in being a, a band person and ironically already, you know, conducting the community band, but not the band at the school where I was teaching. Um, so that's been really nice, except that I haven't really dropped anything except for teaching private lessons. So I'm kind of insane. And, you know, some days I just love it. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm back to back to back with things. And, and I, I love that excitement and I love toggling tasks, you know, and I'm kind of ADD. So it works for me to have so many irons and so many fires, but almost every single day at some point I hit a wall. And I think that's pretty standard with all of us. Um, today I had a little 10 minute break between like, I had just finished doing, um, like the penance service over at the church and I had five minutes before my kindergartners came in. And so I had to make a choice. Could I respond to an email? Cause my inbox is always a hundred emails deep. Could I go make those copies for band tomorrow? Um, could I go deliver the flyers to fourth grade for our, our next year's band fitting night? You know, so there's always things to do, but I did follow my own advice and I sat there and did nothing for two solid minutes. Uh huh. And then here's my newest piece of advice. Um, <clears throat> Cause I've been all about, you know, changing your lifestyle so that you can have the job so that you can thrive. Like my book is called the music educators guide to thrive. And it's all about kind of crafting your lifestyle and those, you know, day-to-day -day maintenance things that you have to do to continuously be happy and be able to make those choices to be mindful throughout your day. Um, but I never really thought of asking your job to change. So mm -hmm last week and, and for, for a while I've been thinking, you know, this is too much. This job is just too much. Um, and so I finally just went into my principal and I said, this job is too much for one person. And he said, well, what, what do you want to do about it? Um, and I saw this as following my own, you know, anti burnout device, um, advice. And he said, well, what do you want to do about it? And I said, well, I think we could do two part-time people. And he said, that's not in the budget. They like the continuity of having just one full-time person. And he didn't know why I would want to go back to part-time. <laughs> and I'm like, to have a life again, man. Right. <laughs> and uh, I said, I said, boss, I can't ride my mountain bike. I don't have time. And I, and he's a big mountain biker. So like he gets that. Um, and so he didn't say, you know, well, you have to choose. You, you can leave or you can stay and stay on full-time. He said, what do we need to do? to make your schedule manageable. Mm -hmm. He's like, we, we don't want to lose you. You're a great music teacher. Um, so I, I had the choice, of course, of I could have just walked in there and, and said, look, I'm burned out. I quit. I have all these other things I want to do. I'll go find a different part-time job. Um, or I could have just continued to, to suffer. But instead, I spoke up for myself. And now they're bending over backwards to do what they can to keep me. That's very cool. So are you... Is that a good example? Yeah, no, that's a great example. You kind of grabbed your uh, your circumstances and adjusted them. So make sure I, I understand that correctly. So you are uh, you were full-time at the at the K through 8, and now it's technically a part-time position? No, just or, or the opposite. I was part-time. Oh. And now I'm full-time. Oh, okay. And so... Yeah, so yeah. I went from working four hours a day to now I leave my house at like 6.30 in the morning and I'm not home till five o'clock most days. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not all work. I do have like, I'm shuttling kids around and, and stuff like that. But, but still, you know, I, I really have to force myself to do those self-care things. Like yesterday was a teacher work day 
Um, so I went to school, I got a ton of work done and I went and got a massage, you yeah. know, and, um, it, well, cause you know, I had the opportunity, my massage therapist, she, she, she works when I work. And so on teacher work days or days that we have off, I always try and like squeeze that in. Yeah. Um, some other things that I, my own advice that I follow pretty religiously is I do wake up every morning early and I, I meditate, I write my journal, I go over my affirmations, my vision, and I do yoga. And then I try and go over some of that same stuff before bed. And then I am pretty religious about what I call dirt church. Do you know about dirt church? I don't know dirt church. Tell me, about, tell us about dirt church. Well, so I'm a big um, trail person too. Like I said, I hike, I trail run, I mountain bike. Um, I have a trail blog actually. And, you know, a few years ago when, when I was still a, a stay at home mom primarily, and then had a, a pretty robust private lesson studio, um, I decided to give myself this, this challenge to do a trail a day every day for a year. And so that was my first blog was, was actually starting that. So I've, I've kind of continued that. And now every Sunday, the rule is it's family time, first of all, and we do some kind of trail outdoorsy adventure and I do not do work. I very rarely answer emails and only if it's kind of like an emergency, like this has to happen tomorrow kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very rarely on social media. It's like, it's like a day of fasting from the rest of the world. And I get to just, just do dirt church. We, <laughs> so like this, just, um, a couple of days ago, um, it was dirt church day and we drove, um, over to Moab, Utah and went hiking in Arches National Park. Um, that's not what we, what we always do. Often we end up in the mountains. I'm, I'm in a really great area in Western Colorado where within, you know, five minutes I can be in a national monument and in 10 minutes I can be in a national conservation area. And within a two hour drive, I can be skiing, floating down the Colorado river. I could be sitting at a hot springs in the San Juan mountains. Like we, we live in a pretty cool area for that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the other rule that I really strictly follow is work I work at school stays at school and I there's one solid day a week when I don't do any kind of work I just go to church that dirt dirt church right yeah <laughs> that's awesome I, I uh, I'm with you on on almost all that I'm not quite yet to the point where I have one day where I do no work um, I that's not really part of my vibe but I do uh, I do completely uh, agree with the not taking the work from school to home uh, that's been something that uh, I don't know if you've experienced this, but as a younger teacher, as a less experienced teacher, that was harder. Uh, but now, now that I've, I mean, I've, I'm at uh, 16 years into teaching now. And, uh, and in, I can say in the last five years or so, I've gotten to the point where I can start to anticipate the things that are going to happen at school well enough to know that I can get this done tomorrow or, uh, or just for as simple things like, my ability to look at the music and know what's supposed to happen without having to take it home and, and study it. Like the, the, those types of things have changed the need that I had when I was a young teacher at age 21 or two or three to, to take a bunch of stuff home and sit up till seven or eight at night, uh, getting ready for the next day. Do you feel like that's changed over the course of your career too? Um, I would say definitely. There's still some tasks that I do uh, bring home, like when I'm preparing for a program, um, I like to create a bunch of practice resources and stuff for my students. And I just don't have prep time for that at school, mm -hmm. but I try and schedule it like during a break. So I usually get all the Christmas stuff together in the fall break time. And, um, we have spring break coming up. Uh, so I'm going to be doing all my end of year program stuff during spring break, but on a daily basis, no. No, mm -hmm. I use my school prep time for that. Yeah, that's great. I uh, I've, I've worked with high school kids nine through twelve, so the the practice track thing is something that I I I won't do for them at at this point. They're like uh, my philosophy on that is if you can't learn take a song home and learn it on your own, then I've failed in the classroom. So <laughs> you're going to have to go ahead and figure this one out on your own. Uh, and well, that, but right, right. But if you pulled something out, like if you were your own piano accompanist. You uh -huh. would, you would take time to learn that piece at, at home, right? If I was my own accompanist, but we have a full-time staff one. 
So I don't have. Well, to, uh, that's <laughs> so fancy, Chris. It, 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 Come on now. Yeah, it's pretty fancy. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, I teach uh, in a staff of uh, with a staff of three, so I have a full time assist, assistant director and then a full time accompanist. But it's a big it's a big program. We've got 320, 330 kids in choir, nine through twelve. Um, so there's a, there's still a lot to do. I think my biggest challenge is is not the work to take home. It's the getting to know all the kids. Um, that's, I think that's my the hardest thing for me is that I, I feel like kids sometimes slip through the cracks in our program. Uh, and I've talked about this actually on a different episode on my show about the, this idea of uh, how do I, how do I find at least something interesting that I can internalize about each and every kid when there's just so many darn ones of them. And I don't have that much time in the day. So that's, I think my biggest challenge. Uh, you were talking about earlier that you're not on social media very much. I'm on social media a lot. And what one of the things that uh, that I've discovered over the last seven or eight years, again, working with high school kids, a little bit different. Um, my presence on social media has helped me in the classroom um, in, in very, very real ways, because I, I have very open social media, meaning I don't block anything. I like it. Mine's completely open to the public. I have a I don't have anything to hide kind of a mentality. And so my, I've discovered that I've felt that my students have started to see me as like just a regular person, like with kids and a life and all that kind of stuff. It makes me less scary. Uh, so, but that's a kind of a teenage thing because they're, they're scared of you uh, oftentimes. Well, to, to be fair, I said I'm not on social media on Sundays. Oh, Oh, I, I misunderstood. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I'm definitely, I'm definitely on there um, a fair amount, but yeah, I have like a website. I, I finally got sick of handing out like business cards that have 17,000 different, you know, websites on them. So I just created my own little online portfolio, just elisajansen.com or whatever. Uh -huh. And I have a page on there that where I put all of the resources for my students. So it's like elisajansen.com slash my school. And some of the middle schoolers started Googling me and looking at all the stuff on my website. <laughs> but, you know, even though not a lot of my students are on social media, their parents are. Right. And so yep. I'm friends with a lot of their parents and I'm at a pretty close knit school. We have 450 kids school wide. So that means I have about what, 430 students or something. Okay. Um, it's just those handful that don't, don't take uh, music in middle school, but um, friends with a lot of their parents. And so I actually get to see that uh, their their home life and the kids who are so, um, what what's the right word? Maybe closed off or just so quiet, so well-behaved. And then you see like a video of them jumping their BMX bike and you're like, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it works the other way too. Sometimes just being able to see your students and, and their families as, as regular people. I, I know for me, um, early on in my career, my big, one of my biggest challenges in classroom management was connecting with and resonating with my male students. I, I, which is a very strange thing. I, cause I'm super, I'm a guy's guy. I was a varsity athlete in high school. I did all this, all the bro things, but I could not, I could not connect with my male students. I don't know if it was like a, uh, like an alpha male problem. Like they were, were challenging each other or, or what, um, but it, but once I had a son, that all changed. Uh, I started to see them as, as individual people, uh, that, that maybe my kid could grow up to be just like this teenage, you know, weirdo kid that I, that before I would have discounted or, or whatever. And so that's changed. And then just seeing them as part of their families on social media, as like being friends with their parents, like you said, you, you can kind of see a, a bigger picture of who they are. It's helped me. And I, and I can understand though, that some people wouldn't see it that way. Some people want to have their own private life, be private. I respect that completely. And just for me, it's, it's helped. Hashtag all the bro things. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah, do. All, <laughs> well, I mean, I can tell you, man, we're working with a high school men's choir. If you can't, if you can't make sports analogies, uh, God help you. Like you're going to, you're going to really struggle um, to, to get them to understand. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so I, I had you uh, come on the show uh, wanting to talk a little bit about some of these uh, aspects of kind of lifestyle and, and burnout, not because I feel like I burn out. I, I'm fortunate. I, I love my job and I can't imagine a time where I would ever retire. Like it, 
I go in every day excited. I leave every day excited. So uh, that's not my issue. But I do want to help people out there who don't feel that because I feel like I read a lot about it on social media and in Facebook groups and different uh, people who get on Facebook groups with these horror stories of, of the types of teaching situations that they're in. Uh, and I, and I, I feel for them. And so what is your sense, uh, having spoken to more, more teachers probably about this than I have, uh, of what causes the teacher burnout? What, if you could put your finger on a few common causes that when you talk to people, like what makes them want to just give up? Um, so, so what you're talking about is actually the, um, not, not the root cause you're talking about the symptom. So okay. the symptom is, is, is burnout. It's that you don't want to go to your job. You feel like, you know, you have a lot of anxiety about it. Um, you're getting that Sunday night anxiety. You feel like your life is out of balance. And I always like to preach life is never in balance. You're always, mm -hmm. you know, working on different areas of emphasis at a different time. Uh, so the, the root cause is that we're being thrown into a job without being properly trained. So a lot of the, the, the advice that I give when it comes to burnout is not from the realm of music education. It's from the realm of entrepreneurship because okay. my philosophy is, um, and, and I don't know if we didn't mention this, but I do have a master of business administration degree. So my master's degree is actually in business management and strategy. We're not taught classroom management in a really great, practical, effective way. We're not taught modern methodologies. You know, we're, 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 we're not properly trained and we're thrown into the deep end of the pool. And so who wouldn't feel, you know, a little bit of stress and anxiety and burnout. And then the other thing is, is we, we hold ourselves to such a high standard. We, you know, thrive on martyrdom unfortunately, you know, you see, I see a lot of posts in, in band director groups where it's like, Hey, it's marching band season. That means I got here in the dark and I left in the dark and my family life is suffering. And that's like worn as a badge of honor, which is a, a cultural problem for us. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and so, and, and then, you know, social media just amplifies it because you can post these horror stories and what do you get? A lot of empathy. And so that actually feeds like the empathy is rewarding that instead of you sitting down and going, okay, you know what? I can blame others, but really I'm, I'm the root cause here. And I'm the only one that I can change. You can't change your administration. You can't change the other teachers at your school. You can't change the bad behaviors of your student. All that you can do is change your reaction to those things. All you can do is work on your own diplomacy and negotiation skills so that you know how to deal with your administrator better. You can work on your team building skills and opening yourself up to the other teachers at your school so that they aren't driving you crazy, you know? So I don't know. Mm -hmm. to, to me, the root cause is we're being thrown in without being properly trained. And we aren't being properly trained because I, I, can't, I can't say it. I'll get in such trouble. Oh, not, not here. Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you're going to say, but I, I'm, we're not censored here. So go ahead. Well, go for it. okay. So it's, um, it goes back to just a few months ago, actually. Um, I got a lot of great social media attention because the article that I wrote for NAFME, the National Association for Music Education, um, was their number one blog post for 2018. So congratulations. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but it was, it was called like seven skills you're not taught as a music education student that you'll wish you had or something like that. Remember, forget the exact words. And, um, I got forwarded from NAFME some a little bit of backlash from college programs where they're like, you know, maybe that was your experience, but that's not how it is in the real world. And I'm like, you know what? I wasn't citing my experience. I was citing these multiple surveys that I've taken, that I've researched, and multiple sessions that I've given, and, you know, all the research I've done for books and stuff like that. So I, you know, if, if there is a college program out there that's doing it right, I'd love to hear about it come on my podcast, come on Chris's podcast and, and tell us about it. But I feel like the collegiate institutions are so out of touch with what's actually happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're being trained so much on theology and then so much on content without being trained in the vehicle for getting that content to matter to students. We we're, we're in a top down approach instead of that student centered approach. You know, we're mm -hmm. teaching music history. Sorry, Chris, you totally got me going off now. Oh, no, this is great. I but love it. 
but you know, we're, we're, we're teaching music history, how we were taught music history, which is from the beginning of time to current. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have flipped that entirely. I teach music history backward. So we start with things that the kids are familiar with. So the big, you know, composers of today, I teach Elton John Mm -hmm. alongside with John Williams and I show them clips from, you know, Elton John's musical and Elton John's, uh, you know, animated movies and stuff like that. And then we work backward from there so that they're always connecting. They're getting the influence of of these these things. So we we learn about John Williams and that immediately leads into Aaron Copeland, which leads back to Clara Schumann, which leads, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. And they're going to connect it more easily. That makes total sense. Exactly. And then like, I realized that this approach was working and I did it solely because I wanted my students to care. I wanted them to connect with it. And so it wasn't, this is how we've always taught it. This is how I was taught it. This is how we're going to teach it. It makes more sense this way. For kids, it doesn't. It makes sense to do it in a way that they understand Mm -hmm. and that they can connect with. And amazingly enough, the feedback I got, and I don't ask for feedback, but I get parents who were coming up to me and were like, did you teach about Beethoven? Because Beethoven came on on a commercial and my little second grader said, Oh my gosh, mom, this is Beethoven. Da, 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 da. You know? <laughs> right. And so, so that's, I don't know. That's the root cause of, of burnout in my mind is that there's so much to this job. There's program management, there's budgeting, there's um, marketing, you know, we call it recruitment and retention, but it's, uh-huh. it's marketing. It's marketing. Sale. Absolutely. Yep. It's, it's all the same stuff that I have coached small business owners on, but we aren't coached on it as a teacher. You know, you want to know what I think is behind that? Because actually, it's really funny. We've never met uh, for listeners at home. Elisa and, I, uh, Elisa and I have never met before this podcast, um, but she is uh, singing my tune. It's really funny because I, I, I feel the same way about a lot of the things you just said. And, and I think there's an underlying, uh, since my show has philosophy built into the word, there's an underlo- underlying philosophical problem among the music education profession that leads to a lot of these things. And you, as you just described, we are a business, what, but we don't want to think of ourselves as one. That's the problem. I think many music educators think we're above that. We are, um, we're special in some way uh, where we shouldn't have to sell music education because people should just inherently know that it should be there. Yeah. Um, and, and that frustrates me because what uh, am I, the way I think of it is what, what other profession would be able to just stand there and deliver their product without telling anyone why it's important or why they should have it and expect to still have a job? Yeah, I mean, doctors. Doctors are in high demand, and yet they're, they're at least advertising. They're at least saying why they're, they're yep. important, what makes them special and sets them apart. And they have to fight to stay current. The, mm-hmm. the doctors, doctors have to continuously research and, and read their latest study and evolve what they uh, what their practice looks like uh, in order to stay ahead of all the other doctors. And I feel like in, in the music ed profession, uh, we aren't delivered that message in college very much. Uh, from uh, people that I've talked to, um, it's uh, there's kind of an ivory tower mentality sometimes, uh, where it's just this is inherently obvious. Everyone should have music education, which of course I agree with. Everyone should, but it's as as my the person who is in charge of music education in my little sphere of the of the country of the world, I see that as my job to convince everyone uh, that that's the case, and my job to keep what we do at the school relevant and you know, and, and important in their lives. So yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think that's uh, I can see also how that could lead to burnout uh, mm-hmm. is if you've if you've been raised thinking um, that everybody's going to kiss your feet for being the music teacher at their school. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get to the, your, the real job as a 24 year old first or second year teacher and you realize you're scraping and convincing and begging and, and not getting the same, you know, conducting head uh, action shot moment, you know, that, that you dream, that you dreamed, <laughs> that you dreamed the profession would give you. Um, and I can see, I can see burnout happening there. 
Yeah. Well, and that, that's the other problem is how much time did you spend with a brand new beginning band? You know, when I was in, in college, yeah, we did spend when, once we got accepted into the program and it was a pretty rigorous process. They, they, they're very filtering at the school where I went Brigham Young university, go Cougs. Anyway. So they, they did throw us into a classroom the very first, um, you know, semester that we were in the program, but they put us in the very best teachers programs. And I, I kind of get that, like, we want to see the really good quality teachers, but put us in with the bands that suck, you know, Mm -hmm. like put us in with those choirs that can't shape the vowels properly. And let us, let us help, like, let us see what that's like, because we're taught so much of the pedagogy, but we don't get to do it. And then you know, another problem that I see, at least in, in, in kind of my realm, my sphere of influence is that so many of us go into secondary and we have this dream of like your job, your beautiful, wonderful Chris dream job of K-12 with this 350 people program. But then we end up not getting a job in that. Like three of my best friends are also elementary music teachers in the area where I teach. Not one of us did student teaching in elementary. All of us got our K-12 certification, but we never spent time in an elementary classroom. But mm-hmm. that's where most of the jobs are, is an elementary classroom. So not only are we going in unprepared for the realm of the job, but we're going in unprepared for the majority of the jobs that are available. Mm-hmm. And so I have these great friends who, you know, did all their student teaching with these amazing band directors, these amazing choir directors but then they get into a school that's not amazing. And they're like, well, what, what do I do here? Those, those students don't know how to respond to me the way that they did when I was student teaching. And hey, I was student teaching, you know, the high school band down the road, which was amazing. And now I'm teaching third graders who can't sit still. And that one little boy keeps pulling his pants down. Like, <laughs> I, you you're, laugh, but I am serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Why, so, why won't that kindergartner stop telling me about her play date this weekend? I don't care. <laughs> I can top that. So I had a student. This was my very first year teaching. I was going to tell you a little bit about my very first job too, because it, oh, it was not please. the it, it was not the dream job that I have now. It was uh, a high school nearby here. Um, I was really excited at the at age twenty two to just get a high school position, but it was a nightmare. And it, I loved the kids and some of my uh, kids from that school might be listening because they we stay in touch. So don't if you're listening, I loved you guys. It was not that, but the the program. So like just to give you an idea, the top choir at this at this school, um, I had sopranos and I had altos and I had tenors and then I had guys who could like mumble. You know that that was the bass section. So I was looking for like S S or S A T and clapping songs. Like that was that was pretty much what I was looking for, and. But you, t- you mentioned the little kid that p- uh, pulled his pants down. I, <laughs> I once at that school had to pull a kid off a cheerleader in class who was humping her leg like a dog. <laughs> like, <laughs> so and this is true. And this was a high school age kid. And the, the cheerleader, poor, poor girl, she didn't know what to do. And so she was just frozen. And she's looking at me like with these big eyes, like, help me. And, and, and so, and of course, you, you talk about uh, having uh, not been trained properly in, in undergrad. I, I had no, I'd never been trained for that situation. I didn't know what to do. And I'm not proud of this to this day. But my reaction was, I walked up to the boy and I shook my finger in his face and I said, no, no. <laughs> It was it was just my gut instinct. He's humping her leg like a dog, and so I I, I scolded <laughs> him like a him dog. On the nose, you're like, pop. <laughs> right. He scurried he scurried away, and I was like, what just happened? I had to call <laughs> call the office, and he got pulled out of the classroom. I didn't see him again for a couple of weeks, but yeah. Okay, it, I I have an even better choir okay. story. If you're okay, done. good. Yeah, go. Okay, so I was the band and orchestra teacher at my first school. My my first job straight out of college was truly my dream job. I taught band and orchestra. I grew the program to triple it size in the first couple of years I was there. It, I opened a brand new school. So it was all brand new equipment. I had this big, beautiful auditorium. Oh, uh, sorry, fantasizing. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so it was like this amazing um, situation. I loved it. 
And our first choir director was, was pretty amazing, but then his family moved out of town or something. So he left. So we ended up hiring this new guy who was, who was okay. Um, but really un had no idea how to manage a classroom, just no idea. Um, we, we went to the same, I shouldn't say we went to the same college. We did. Okay. So anyway, um, he had a boy who got in trouble and, and so rather than send him out of the classroom to get in trouble, he told him to just go in the practice room. He had like the one practice room in his office and then the big choir room. And so kid goes into the, the practice room, right? The meanwhile, the bell rings, the class ends, the other, his, that current class leaves, the next class comes in. He forgets that that kid is in the practice room. So meanwhile, he's now teaching like the women's chorus. And I don't think I can even say it. Hang on. And then they start to smell something really bad. Uh. <laughs> um, so they start looking around and all of a sudden they notice like this, this lump of poo on the floor. <laughs> it was, it's human. we've got choir kids acting like dogs and that that is we are not ready for this teachers yeah (laughs) but the kid in the practice room was too scared to leave the practice room at the bell and then he had to go to the bathroom and he was still too scared to leave so i guess he just he just pooped and then threw it into the classroom (laughs) so here's i think here's what we're learning we are learning that that collegiate Collegiate music education programs need to have pet training as part of as part of our preparation to avoid burnout. Is that is that what we're is that what you're saying? No, no, definitely it is. I mean, it's 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 all about having realistic expectation, dude. Kids mm-hmm. are weird. Yep. They are they are weird. They are impulsive. They do stuff that you you can never explain. You will never be able to explain them. Um, and while we're at it get CPR certified, like get Mm -hmm. some first aid training and then have band-aids on hand, like constantly. Right. Do you have like a little care kit in your, in your choir classroom? Like with, yeah, the district makes us have one there. They refresh it every so many months and make sure it's got stuff in it. Do you have like a, like an area of stuff that kids can just like access if they need to like tissues or nail clippers or mirrors uh, i don't know i don't no, know what high school kids need i haven't taught no. high school we, we tried to have yeah we tried to have tissues but with 320 students like they go i mean we couldn't keep them in there uh it just it cost a fortune so we the, we're fortunate though where my classroom is the bathroom is right outside the hall um mm-hmm. so they don't have to go very far if they need to blow their nose it, it works out fine but uh okay so i have one more story and then i want to get into another topic okay so, you talk because you brought up you brought up the injury like the like having a first aid kit. Uh, also at this first job, the, like you'd, you'd be amazed. If some we should I should do a podcast just on stories from my first job uh, because it was insane. Um, but there there was this one kid. So it was probably my second week teaching. I'm 22 years old, and big choir class for that school was like 50 kids. Um, and and so the big class just lets out. I let them I let them put their folders away maybe a minute and a half before the bell rings. And a couple of them have kind of drifted towards the door and they're out in the hall, spilling out in the hall, waiting for the you know the passing period bell to ring. And about 30 seconds before the bell rings, I hear screams out in the hall and I hear this like groaning, yelling noise. And I walk out into the hall and I see one of my bases who who somehow is laying on the floor with his leg broken at the middle of the sh- at the middle of the shin and just hanging his his leg is just hanging and and I I he, I he walked out of my classroom like 45 seconds before that so I'm of course my first thought is and I'm, I'm also not I'm not proud of this but my first thought was I'm going to get fired and my second thought was I hope he's okay <laughs> <laughs> um, See, my first thought would have been who tripped him well, and, and, uh, but here's, uh, and that was my assumption, but that's not what happened. What happened was there was a piano out in the hall and this kid is an idiot. And he's talked about kids are, 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 are weird. He had gotten up. Apparently the story I got later was he had gotten up on the piano and he was a big WWF wrestling fan. So he thought it would be a really good idea to jump off the piano and do one of these like body slam things down. And of course, then the kid he was trying to jump on is smart and just moved out of the way. And so he landed on his leg wrong and broke it right so then the they call the nurse we call the nurse and the principal's coming down and of course i'm thinking still okay this is the end like i don't have tenure 
I wasn't taking care of the children. They're going to just let me go. And this is the last day I'm ever going to teach choir. This is all, it's all over. Um, and the first thing the principal said to me when she walked around the corner and she goes, and I'm going to change his name for the purpose of anonymity. We're going to call him T Tim. She said, was it Tim? And I said, yes. And she goes, again? <laughs> And so not only, not only was I not fired, but the mom wasn't even mad. The mom was just like, oh, he does this all the time. This is like the third time he's done this WWF thing. And we're just really sorry. So they're apologizing to me uh, all the while I thought I was, I was done for. So yeah, you're right. It's like the kids are, uh, we, don't, we don't learn what they're really like in, a, in, in our college programs because it's all about uh, again, I think I said it before, it's that ivory tower. It's like, you're going to teach the kids Palestrina and you're going to teach the kids Beethoven and it's going to be glorious. And you do, but you've got to, like you said before, you've got to figure out a way to get them to care because they, that's not why they come to your class. They they uh -huh. come to your, they, they come to your class for social reasons and it's our job to, you know, to get them on the right track. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That That's a good story. Yeah. Oh, like I said, I've got, I've probably got 45 minutes more of those stories. I'll, I'll maybe we'll tell you more on you, later. Yeah. You should have a horror story episode. Oh yeah. If people could call in and, and have their, have their favorite ones. Yeah. Um, that, seriously. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about this, uh, this idea that, uh, about life hacks and lifestyle things, because you, I've seen, I've seen that you're really into that. And, and, and so even if we're not going to talk about like music stuff, um, what are some things that you feel like wouldn't be noticed by the average person or thought of by the average person that just make your life what you want it to be? Hack, hack my life. Um, okay. Let's go priority wise. Let's mm -hmm. say that you're just going to do one thing. You want it to change your life. Do you want that one thing? Sure. Plan your day the night before. Just take out your planner. I usually have mine around. I don't right now. Um, I just use a like a notebook, and I I love I love books. I'm like a bibliophile, right? Mm -hmm. Like I collect antique books, so I love books with neat covers and stuff like that. I have a Game of Thrones one right now. Ooh. Anyway, so just take like ten minutes and plan out your day. Plan what time you're going to wake up, what you're going to eat, what the first thing is you're going to do when you wake up. List all the things you need to get done at your job. List everything that you, all of the appointments you have to take. You know, what, what are you going to have for lunch? What are you going to have for dinner? What are you going to wear? The more decisions you can make ahead of time, the better you're going to sleep at night and the better your next day is going to be. It's going to be so much easier because most of what drains us is decision fatigue. And, and uh. we don't like realize that that's, what it is. It's decision mm -hmm. fatigue. So if we can minimize that decision fatigue ahead of time by planning it the day before and then visualizing it, right? So mm -hmm. go through step by step, like close your eyes and go through your next day and just visualize it. Um, I've done that with especially stressful days, performances. I've done it for triathlons, mountain bike races, right? Um, mm -hmm big, big, uh, concerts that I have to conduct for my community band. I envision myself walking out on stage. What's it going to look like with the place completely full of people? Imagine the, the band or the choir singing beautifully anyway. So yeah, number one life hack is plan your day the night before. Okay. So is it okay if I, if I, um, don't like paper books and I do it on my computer? Yeah. I mean, do, do whatever works, works for you. I, I have kind of a hybrid system. Uh -huh. Um, cause I use Google calendar pretty heavily. Yes. Um, cause it, I, it, it works with my husband's Google calendar is on it. My, you know, childcare schedule is on it. My school stuff appears on it. It's all color coded, coded, color coded. All my podcast stuff is on it. So mm -hmm. I go from that, but I, like and and yeah I use the reminders too so I have a morning routine and an evening routine I mean do you brush your teeth every day uh, uh yeah right so you already have a routine right and you probably <laughs> yeah. eat a couple meals you I know eat... I feel like routines are like frowned on but you already do them oh yeah I'm very routine oriented I don't um my days are 
pretty regimented in the sense that I don't feel the need to plan my days every day. Um, because most of, for example, my Mondays are always my Mondays. I get to work at 650 and I go to teach a voice lesson after school. Then I go to the gym and I come back and lead my chamber choir rehearsal until eight o'clock and I get home at eight 30. Uh, mm-hmm. that, so there's not, there's uh, that's every single Monday, uh, that the school's in. And then of course, during the summer, I like to on purpose, not plan my days. Uh, which kind of kind of feels kind of feels nice, but I, I agree with you, especially about the the decision fatigue uh, that people, especially if you're an indecisive person, in the first place. The, the, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because if you're indecisive and and then you don't do that work ahead of time, then you get in the moment and you're there's anxiety that's built up because you hadn't made the plan ahead of time. So that yeah, that that makes a whole lot of sense. Paralysis by analysis mm-hmm. is, you know, what it comes down to. So yeah. And I have days like that too. Like I don't, I don't plan out my Saturdays and I never plan anything for Sunday. Like I said, uh-huh. Saturday is just a checklist, but the other days, all my weekdays, it's all, all those things I said, what time am I waking up? What do I do when I first wake up? I have everything prepped the night before, mm-hmm. but see that that, then we get into like the the really weird stuff that I do because I follow this kind of entrepreneurial lifestyle that teachers don't tend to. Mm-hmm. So do you want to hear some of the weirder stuff that I've done? Please. Okay. So like eating the same thing for breakfast and lunch every day. So breakfast is usually two eggs and I switch it up. Sometimes it's boiled. Sometimes they're fried. Um, usually half an avocado and some kind of fruit, usually an apple with some almond butter. And then I have tea with that as well. So that's breakfast. And then usually for lunch, it's like some kind of um, like really lean meat, like turkey or chicken or maybe leftovers from the night before. And then a bunch, just a bunch of vegetables, just as many vegetables as I can stand. And that's what I have for breakfast and lunch like every day. So I, again, don't have to plan it. Don't have to think about it. Don't have to shop for something different. I know that it's healthy and I'm not picky about, about it. If I feel like I need to switch something up, I switch up the, you know, which fruit is in season or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And then I have like a list of meals that I rotate through as well for dinners. And most of them can be prepped in the morning when I'm up really early. So that's one thing. It's just like have, have everything kind of planned and, and dialed in. And again, do I stick to that on the weekends? Probably not. Usually on the weekends, I go do yoga in the sunrise and you know, whatever. Um, so <laughs> you know, another basic thing, stuff. Yeah. You know, basic <laughs> stuff, whatever. Go up on a cliff, little red rock cliff, watch the sunrise, do some yoga. Um, other stuff that I probably shouldn't say cause we're in mixed company, but anyway, so <laughs> as if, as if talking about throwing poop in the choir room was not enough. Uh, so <laughs> Okay. So that's another thing is the, is the, the meal planning thing. And then, um, just being a minimalist with stuff that you own because things that you own actually like require your energy. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've been known to like every three months I go through my wardrobe and just get rid of a bunch of stuff. Usually I hand it to my teenage daughter, right. Mm -hmm. Who loves to steal my clothes anyway. Um, but I've heard of entrepreneurs. I have yet to do this, but just wear like all the same color or they get like all the same shirts. Like you've probably heard of Steve Jobs doing that. He wore the same thing every day. I mean, it was always clean, but it was always kind of the the same thing. So I have about like five work outfits and then like five workout outfits. And that's pretty much it. And then I just wow. kind of rotate through them and then they're, they're kind of seasonal. So like this time of year, I have boots. Um, as it gets warmer, I honestly will wear flip-flops every possible day. I mean, they're fancy flip-flops, you know. Oh, I'm a huge flip flop person. Oh my yeah, gosh, I, I'd be I love flip flops. Oh, I agree. We're like the same person. That's oh that's my what gosh. We're, yeah, I, like because I, I you were you said how weird it was that you eat the same thing for breakfast and lunch. I I I, I do that too. Um, every my breakfast every single day is a Shakeology shake and coffee, um, and then for lunch, well, partly partly I can't claim this as a strategy. I don't have a lunch at school. I give up. A, I teach during my lunch period, and I. I get paid for it, which is nice, but I don't have a lunch. So I have about a passing period to eat. So every day I have two chicken sausages microwaved with no bun and uh, a, a Greek yogurt every single day. 
Nice. Yeah, they, they have different flavors of both of those things. So I can shake, like change that up, but that's about all I've got time for. And I'm usually eating that while my men's choir is coming in, like to, <laughs> to have class. See, but it, but it totally works, right? Yeah. Could you mm-hmm. imagine if you like had to, had to individually plan every meal oh. and then like have to go and shop for it? Like I, I despise shopping. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think that's, that it does. It takes a lot of the stress out of the day, just knowing I, I have a refrigerator at school. I've got it loaded every couple of weeks. I go to the grocery store and it's got what I need in it. So I don't have to think about it. Don't have to go eat school food, um, which would be a nightmare. Um, <laughs> I, I, Talk I, about I, poop in the choir room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let's, uh, I, I'm going to f- have us finish with a, an idea um, that I would, I'd like your, your thoughts on. I, you kind of touched on this, but if you could kind of capsulate it um, for what, what my listeners really need to know, like if there's a day where you, um, where you're really, where if you're struggling to find the motivation or find the energy or find the spark that you need, that, that you feel like your kids deserve, what is the, uh, what's your best bit of advice? And maybe you've gotten past that in your life where you kind of don't have that feeling anymore. I don't oh, know. No, I do. Okay. I do. All right. So what, where do you go? Like, where do you, what's that place in your mind or in your heart that you go to try to get through that day and give the kids what they need and what they deserve? Okay. So, so there's a couple things. Um, number one is think of yourself first. And I know we're like taught from birth. Don't be selfish, da, da, no. da, da, da. but yeah. being selfish is different from self care. Mm-hmm. So think, okay, I'm not feeling it. What do I need? And so my first thought is, you know what? This is my job. This is my career. It's not my life. And so I focus on my life and I go, okay, I'm at work till three o'clock. I'm teaching and then I get to go pick up my daughter. And you know what? I still get to come home in the evening. And so that's what I end up living for that day is, you know what? I I have a life outside of work. This job is eventually going to end. I'm eventually going to transition to something else. So it's a temporary thing. I think if we feel like it's so permanent, then we get so much anxiety and you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so that's one thing is to think this is, this is my job. It's not my life. I want my life. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is to think about ways that you can feel like you're being cared for yourself. Um, especially on those days when you're not feeling it. Or for me, it's days when I have a big program or back-to-back concerts, or I have a program during the day and then a rehearsal at night. You know, we have those, you you know, those busy days. It's like, it doesn't rain, but it pours. Mm -hmm. And so you do really nice things for yourself that day. So um, I don't get really fancy coffees, but I might on that day, or I might go get that really amazing avocado toast at the coffee shop on my way to work. Or I will wear my really nice, um, my favorite like wool socks or my socks that say carpe the mm, F word out of this DM, right? (laughs) Um, Which by the way, fun fact, I, I told this exact same thing in my conference presentation at the NAFME conference um, a couple years ago. And one of the people in that session loved that. She's like, oh my gosh, I love socks. I'm totally going to find socks with the F word on them. And she ended up finding the exact same socks. And then she ended up wearing them to the Grammys when she won the Music Educator of the Year Grammy Award. Oh, that's awesome. I, yeah, I, I was so, given, I have, I, just for, this is real quick. I was given by a student, by one of my high school students, a gift at the end of the year last year that were socks. And the socks were, and I quote, ringleader of the shit show that was <laughs> those were the socks that i got it was brilliant and i and i i wear them to school because of course you can't read them when my pants are are, are pulled down but it's pretty funny. oh right it's yeah. boot season like yeah. i said nobody right. knows what i got on under there but, but i know except <laughs> i do yeah <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so awesome. yeah just a- anything like that 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 makes you feel particularly good you know something yeah. to eat or drink or wear or C, um, I have a mug that says like, don't forget you're awesome. Like that's my go-to mug on days. Or I have one that says love the moment. Um, so I call these things uh, like totems. So surround yourself with totems. Surround yourself with, with things that remind you how much you love yourself. 
mm-hmm. and things that you love. So then the third thing is to remember why you're there. And it's not about the music. It's about the students. If you're in there for the music, you're in the wrong profession mm-hmm. because it's, it has to be student centered or you will burn out. The song's going to end when you cut off. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so for me, my first class of the day is my fifth graders. It's 51 kids who I've now had since they were in, let's see, fifth, fourth, third, second grade. I've had them since second grade. So I've watched them grow and they are amazing musicians. It just is outstanding. And so on the days when I'm like, oh, I just want to stay home. Like I have all this stuff. I have this podcast to edit. I have this book I'm in the middle of working on. I have these articles I need to get in. I have you know, appointments that people want to make with me. People want to make appointments with me. I can't do it because I'm, it's, it's, I'm gone all day long, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm like, oh man, I should really work on my music education conference and all these other things. And then I remember those fifth graders and I'm like, you know what though? That's not a bad way to start the day. And so just like, remember those, those kids, not the, not the little shits that, you know, drive you insane, Mm -hmm. but like the kids who are there for a purpose, the kids who you've watched grow from ninth grade to 12th grade, Mm -hmm. you know, the kids who give you purpose and, and think of them. Yeah, absolutely. The, The kids, the kids don't, especially those fifth graders, I'm sure they're proud of all the other things that you do and that you're such an intrepid music educator, but ultimately they don't even know. My students don't even know all these things about me, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. But even then at some level, they don't care. Like you're, you're there, you're there for them in that moment. And I, and I feel that way too. I do a lot of stuff outside of my high school classroom and I try to figure out ways to make those things. The other things I do make me better when I'm in front of the kids you know, when I work with my professional ensemble, um, I'm raising my standards so that so that I can be a, a, a more of an expert for my kids. It's it's they, it all works together, and ultimately, I'm there for them. So I I, I, I think we're totally on the same page. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been really really fun chatting with you, and uh, and and we're gonna get to do it do it again soon, which is really fun. Uh, so everybody out there uh, listening, make sure that you go and check out the Music Ed Mentor podcast. Uh, make sure you check out uh, elisajansen.com uh, and find out all these the great things that this awesome music, music educator is doing. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. This has been really fun. You're welcome. Yeah, totally fun for me too. And now it's your turn to come on my podcast. That's, we're going to do it. We're, let's make a date. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Elisa Jansen Jones. Uh, she is a lot of fun, and by the time this podcast episode comes out, we will have already uh, recorded a second conversation that you'll be able to hear on her show on the Music Ed Mentor podcast, where we will talk about uh, maintaining realistic expectations for the students in your classroom. I hope that you will come around again and listen to some more content as it comes out. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, uh, really anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Uh, You can go directly to Coralosophy.com. We're also over on YouTube under Coralosophy, and you can join the Coralosophers page on Facebook to join the conversation, and I always love when listeners respond to things they heard on the show and ask questions and keep the conversation going. And as always, be sure to head over to SightReadingFactory.com and RyanMain.com and check out their products. Enter Coralosophy at checkout for your 10% discount on some really awesome music education products at both of those websites. Hope to catch you next time on the Coralosophy podcast. Thanks for tuning in.